Mini episode 1456 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1456. You have two original FDH Lounge dignitaries here today. It is I, FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris, along with our FDH Director of Research, Nate Noy. And uh, sometimes here on the show, when we catch up, it's a preview of March Madness, and that's exactly what we're doing here today. We're going through it, and uh, there's nobody. And I mean nobody that goes breaking down the brackets, what they should have been, what they were, how it benefits different teams here. Nobody does that like our director of research. My close personal friend, Nate Noy. Always a pleasure to get one of our originals back on, and especially my good pal, Nate. How you doing today, buddy? Doing great, Rick. Thanks for all the accolades. I don't know if I deserve all that, but I did spend a lot of time the last four or five days really trying to understand what this committee did and why they did it. So Yeah. There's, there's a lot to unpack there, and uh, you were uh, advising me of things as of last week, and uh, I was going through over the weekend transcribing some of the notes on my phone from things you were texting me, and uh, that helped me in terms of uh, making out my own bracket and going through and some things that you said to look for. And uh, the, uh, the first of the quadrants, as folks traditionally kind of tend to break these down, going left to right across your radio dial, would be the western region upper left in the uh, bracket here, and uh, that is one where uh, Gonzaga, the number one seed overall, happens to reside at the top of the bracket, Duke at the bottom of the bracket. It's an interesting one here. Uh, you, you have some other uh, teams in there that could be uh, causing some noise uh, potentially, and uh, you know, very, very interesting SEC flavor with teams such as Arkansas and Alabama in there. So how do you see this one uh, shaking out? Well, Rick, I think we both are in agreement that Gonzaga's got a fairly clear path. One thing I look at when I break down the tournaments, I went back and I looked at the, I actually went back at least 20 years, but the last five tournaments, 16 of the 20 teams in the Final Four started the tournament with at least a 90 sagger rate. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's an 80%. So when I, when I analyze these things, basically I treat it like a heavyweight fighter. But if you're 90, you're Mike Tyson in his prime. Sure. And if you're not a 90, then you're not Mike Tyson. And you're probably not going to beat a 90 unless you're a 90. Now, given that, when you face another 90, it's like Mike Tyson facing Mike Tyson. So after you beat Mike Mike Tyson, even though you're Mike Tyson, you're beat up. So if you have to flip around and play another 90 after that, then you're probably going to lose. So that's kind of the approach I went with my bracket. Gonzaga doesn't see a 90 until the Final Four. And I can't imagine him not winning four games to get there. I would agree with that. And uh, when you look at this, it, it is very interesting in the sense that, uh, and again, you have more of the, I think, historical grasp on this than I do. At first glance, it seems as though whether you're looking at the 90s or any on the Sagarins or some of the other leading indicators out there, it seems like this is a little bit more of a top-heavy year as far as the uh, the nomenclature, the top teams, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the grouping there at the top, uh, it, it seems to be more of a separator, I would think, than in some other years between them and everybody else. Are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, I'm not only seeing it, I'm feeling it, Rick. When you watch these teams play basketball, like you watch Tennessee knock around with Kentucky, and then they obliterate Texas a and because they're one of those seven teams in the country that's a 90. So those seven 90s are huge. They're dangerous. And I got four of them in the final four, uh, starting with Gonzaga, because they just don't have to face anybody until they get there. I do as well. I've got, uh, I, again, I was really going a lot off of what you were talking about, so I have all 90s in the Final Four. Uh, the, the one time where I'm sticking my neck out at least a little bit here uh, in this side of the bracket, uh, I, I'm not doing as much in the way of picking upsets as I am in some of the other regions, but uh, I've got Davidson over Michigan State, a 10 over a 7. That's as big as I went for an upset in this bracket. 
In this bracket, I have, uh, and I don't have Davidson. I think Sparty's tough. The road to, I will give you the, the fact that Davidson's basically a home game in Greenville, mm-hmm. and the Duke fans are going to pull for Davidson, not pull for Sparty. Sure. But the committee wanted Izzo and Izzo and Coach K. Right. Let's be serious. That's what they want. Committee usually gets what they want. Sure. So I, I stuck with Sparty on that one. That's a coin flip game, though. It's really tight. Uh, not a lot of surprises. Again, they don't set up surprises for the Gonzaga bracket. What I do have is Texas Tech beating Duke to make it to the final eight, but not beating Gonzaga. I have Connecticut over Arkansas, and I think Alabama just steamrolls this 11 seed. Two 11 seeds that I knew were in the tournament, but didn't belong because <laughs> the, the, the Rutgers has a has a Sagar of 57. Notre Dame has a Sagar of 54. Yes. That means they're not the fifth, top 50 teams in the country. This tournament gives 22 bids to the automatic qualifiers, meaning the top 46 teams in the country should be in the tournament. If you're number 57 and number 54, you don't even belong there. So Alabama shouldn't have any problem in, this, in that first round. Um, pretty much, like I said, chalk. I like Gonzaga to play Texas Tech. I like Connecticut to beat Arkansas. I'm going to get stomped by Gonzaga. And I don't think Duke gets past Texas Tech. I think that's for the end of the Coach K run. Uh, in that bracket. So. Interesting. Okay, I, I've got a few things that are just a little bit different. I do have Arkansas getting past UConn, and I have uh, Duke beating uh, Alabama, not playing Texas Tech. I've got Gonzaga over Duke in the final, uh, the Elite Eight. And uh, again, that that kind of a setting, that is going to make for a, a very dramatic closeout to Coach K's career. Those Elite Eight games, each one in its own national window, you know what I mean? If it ends up being there, it'll be something where the networks are going to get their money's worth out of it. And you tapped into what the committee's looking for. So, you know, I'm taking Texas Tech in an upset, which is a hard thing to do, pick against what the committee wants. But, uh, again, that's a good – we'll see when Coach K runs out of steam. We, we <laughs> will see, yeah. Thing. It's going to be uh, fascinating. Uh, talk about fascinating. Uh, to me, the East bracket – uh, in the lower left is probably the most fascinating one as as far as the way that they have it stacked with a lot of these different teams in there. Uh, Baylor on the one line at the bottom of the bracket, it's Kentucky uh, at the two, but you've also got Purdue. You, you've got a Purdue-Kentucky matchup uh, potentially in the uh, Sweet 16, and I do have that one coming off. That, that could be a game for the ages. Uh, I don't have a lot in the way of uh, decent-sized upsets here. Again, I'm relatively chalk heavy in this bracket. I do have Vatek over Texas, an 11 over a 6 in the first round, and uh, I know that there's a popular uh, strain of thought here, uh, t- number 10 San Francisco over number 7 Murray State. Uh, I don't go that way. I do have Murray State uh, winning and then uh, probably getting uh, just absolutely uh, road stopped by Kentucky thereafter, but uh, I've got uh, Baylor over UCLA to make it to the Elite Eight, uh, Kentucky over Purdue and what I think will be a classic and Baylor surviving Kentucky to make it to the elite or to the final four in my bracket. And that's a great, and that's, that's a logical way to go with this, Rick. The one thing that jumps out at me on this bracket, and one of the things you look at when you're throwing out your bracket, especially in the first round, look at the point spreads. And when you see a huge seed difference with a small point spread, mm-hmm. go, with the, go with the huge seed because that team's got a chance. And Vatek's a one point dog, Texas. So Vatek just obliterated Duke to winning ACC. Right. You know, Texas bowed out in their tournament fairly early. So I like Vatek to pull an upset. And here's the thing. I think Purdue is soft. I watched Purdue play Sparty. Uh-huh. They struggled that whole game, and they didn't look impressive at all against Iowa. I don't think Purdue can beat Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech just ran the ACC. So every year, I mean, we've got a long string of 11s making to the Sweet 16. Yeah. It's really hard not to pick at least one. So I'm with Vatek this year. And... <clears throat> As you were saying about the Murray State thing, Murray State's playing in Indianapolis, the same place as Kentucky, right by them. Right. Murray State's from Kentucky. Kentucky will fill the stand. It'll be a full house of blue, and those people will root for Murray State. Murray State drives a couple hours up the road to play that game. San Francisco flies across the country to face a hostile environment. Murray State looks good. <laughs> oh, they do. So, That's and a- I don't think... I don't think they can face. I mean, again, Kentucky will probably tear them up. Uh, I like Memphis. I like Boise actually over Memphis in that eight nine game. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry, that was the last bracket. I hit slipped in my own paper. <laughs> I definitely like UNC, but they're not going to be able to take out Baylor. Right. Uh, I don't like SMC. I think the 12 seed play and beats them, especially if it's Indiana. Indiana's playing a home game in the playing game in Dayton, and I think they're going to go out there and beat SMC. But I see UCLA playing Baylor in the Sweet 16, and Texas. <clears throat> I mean, Duke playing. I mean, 
Kentucky playing Vatek. So based on the premise of what I was talking about earlier about the heavyweight fights, mm-hmm. UCLA is no chump. I really think they could play with Baylor. I really thought hard about that game. I looked at a lot of numbers. Baylor's just above with a nine. UCLA is not. So I took Baylor. But Kentucky, if they play Vatek or the soft Purdue team, who I already said is soft, they're not going to have a problem. So Kentucky's going to go into that elite matchup not nearly as battered as Baylor. And I think that's a chance for Kentucky to make the Final Four by knocking off Baylor because they had to go through a heck of a game with UCLA, and Kentucky's coming off a cruise. So I'm going with Kentucky as a Final Four team this year. Very interesting. Now, it, I, I want to, in terms of the game theory of the brackets and everything like this, if, if my whole kind of uh, way of looking at this is right, and it does end up being Purdue and Kentucky, and I'm not – I hear what you're saying about Purdue, but I'm not quite as down on them. So my thought being that if, if you've got Purdue, Kentucky, Baylor as the top three seeds, to me this is one of those regions where, uh, again, uh, I, I think it's a little bit tougher to come, in my estimation, to come out of the Purdue-Kentucky game uh, than it is the other game. So if I'm looking at it here, the major reason that I picked Baylor to come out of this bracket is, again, if they're playing Kentucky straight up, I don't know that I would necessarily make that pick. But in my mind, Kentucky's got to go through Purdue first. Baylor doesn't. So that's my kind of a thing here of if you're looking at a team to make it. basically, in a nutshell, showed how these things can escalate into different trees. Yes. Because I took Vautech, and I don't think Vautech has a chance against Kentucky, but they do have a chance against Purdue. Yes. But if Purdue beats them, then Kentucky's in a whole different world again. Even though I think Purdue's soft, the data doesn't say Purdue's soft, I might be wrong. So, yes, I agree with your logic. Same logic as I'm using. You just look at the matchups a little different. Yes. You consider Purdue to go on through. I don't. And that changes the world. Yeah, in a tournament like this, we know this. It is kind of funny. Yeah, I think we're we're actually applying the same principle in a different kind of a way because you're you're looking at it being a tougher game for uh, Baylor against UCLA than some of the potential games in the bottom half of the bracket. So very interesting. We're using the same uh, theory here uh, as far as applying it at least partially to our thoughts uh, over in the uh, northeast part of the bracket here. Geographically, just looking at it on the page, that would be uh, the south region in the upper right part. Uh, This is another uh, very interesting uh, bracket as well. The top half of it really with uh, uh, sort of a hidden power team here. Uh, Houston being stuck on the five line uh, in there with uh, Arizona number one in in the uh, top half of the bracket. In in the bottom half you have Villanova which is uh, one of the real power teams coming into the tournament this year and a two-time recent champion in the tournament uh, along with another legitimate powerhouse on the three-line Tennessee and a couple of schools not one but two that were maybe a little bit of a surprise as far as making the tournament and two teams that ended up uh, managing to duck out of the play-in games no less Uh, the historic arch rivals Ohio State and Michigan uh, both of them ending up making the tournament and uh, in both cases you look at it and the resume seems uh, a little bit uh, unworthy, particularly down the stretch in the way that Ohio State gagged in the Big Ten Championship. But I looked at it and I was like, I don't want to fall into the classic trap because I've done this in years past. Teams that appear not to deserve being in the tournament because they underachieved, that's a trap I wasn't going to fall into. I picked Ohio State and Michigan both to win their opening games because... Ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, like they're not going to look past this game. They might have underachieved previously, but don't fall into the rearview mirror fallacy. Just because a team is not necessarily worthy of being here doesn't mean they won't rise up and win that first game because it's just a matter of stopping underachieving. Right, and, and whether or not they're worthy is all a matter of perspective. The second has Ohio State as 22nd in the country. Right. That means they should have been a six. And it has Michigan as 24th in the country. Yeah. That means they should have been a six. Yeah. But no, they're an 11. Now, get, now, the thing is about Michigan, they're playing a home game. That game's in Indianapolis. Colorado State's going to travel zero people. Right. Zero. So Michigan, Michigan's going to play at home, right at home, in Indy. Not far at all. They're used to that place. They've been there a lot. They were absolutely steamroll. I can't even imagine that game being close. I think I think Michigan wins by double digits. <clears throat> and I'm going to do you one better on the Buckeyes. Yeah. So the committee, there's seven teams we talked about that have a nine. Gonzaga, who faces no one till the final four. Kentucky and Baylor, who got paired together. We'll get to Kansas, who faces no one. But three of the other seven teams are in this bracket. Yep. What this bracket is, is the stop Villanova, stop Houston bracket. 
Because if Villanova makes the Final Four, they're going to beat Tennessee, who's a 90. Then they're going to beat the survivor of Arizona and Houston, who's a 90. Right. They're going to win two 90s, and then they got to play Kansas, probably, who's a 90. Right. So they're not going to make the finals. They've got too much harder path. Same deal for Houston and Arizona. They're going to play each other. Now, Houston's the five seed, but Houston's the fifth best team in the country, according to the computer. Right. So you're going to take the fifth best team in the country on a five seed and make them play a nine, a 90, to get out of to get out of the three sixteen, then make them play another ninety or Villanova to make the final four, to make them play another ninety. So the committee wants no part of Houston or Nova making it to the final four and they stack this bracket to prevent that. Now, Tennessee came out Tennessee, and we, we talked about them and I've got some uh, alternative brackets this year, and I have one with Tennessee winning the championship. I think they can win it all. They just yes. won the SEC. Mm-hmm. They, they're a solid top 17. They're fifth ranked. How are you going to put the fifth ranked team in the country on the three line, Rick? How do yeah. you do that? You're the committee. Ridiculous. They didn't watch the last week they, or factor it in anyways. Right. And then again, you and I talked about that. I told you last Monday, this committee generally makes up a lot of their mind on Monday before the conference tournament starts. This year, they almost made up all of their mind on Monday, except for the automatic qualifiers they had to slot in there later. Because the fact that Tennessee never got off the three line is absolutely ridiculous. But again, the committee does everything for a reason. The reason that happened, they don't want Houston, they won't build over in this final four. Right. And stack to make sure that doesn't happen. That is absolutely right. And I'll tell you this, again, Tennessee, I'm picking them to come out of this region. I've got them beating Arizona in the Elite Eight because of this is an exact usage of the theory that I used for the previous region because Tennessee doesn't have to go through Arizona and Houston. They only got to go through one of them. And that's why they're my team to come out of this region. And Look, I'm a Tennessee Hawk, so I'm hearing a lot of uh, ragging uh, from some of the boys. But, uh, hey, it just so happens to be what I also believe also. Uh, I will be wearing that uh, burnt orange, cheering on this team to the Final Four. I truly uh, believe that. Uh, I will say uh, this is one where I'm sticking my neck out on one of these picks here. I do have a fairly sizable upset, a 13-4. I got Chattanooga taking out Illinois in the first round. It's quite possible, Rick. I don't think Illinois has any chance whatsoever in that next round against Houston. Right. And, you know, they barely got that four seed, and they didn't look well at all, and in in Indiana obliterated them in the Big Ten tournament. So, you know, they're, they're not a very strong basketball team. I can't imagine they're going to be Houston. Yeah, no, um, and I don't think they're going to make it that far. Now, Houston and Chattanooga, that could be historically ugly, I hate to say. <laughs> right, and you and I talked about Ohio State, yeah, it could be historically ugly. Yeah. Um, they're in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is like a sister city to Columbus from when I lived there. There's a lot of ties between those two cities, and they're going to travel real easy over I-70 right. to go pack the stadium. Right. So the Buckeyes, people are not, sorry, uh, Gene Schmidt might be there, but that's about it for LUC this year. Right? Nobody's going to be there. That's right. So, Which one? <laughs> right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Probably when it's not an elected official, was over 90. Inside um, joke. <laughs> <laughs> definitely an inside joke. So I, I like the Buckeyes to be going over, Rick. I think they can do it. I know, I guess, see, you're talking about your Tennessee homerism. I've got a yeah. Buckeye homerism, but I'm not the biggest Buckeye homer, and you know that. And I look at this, and I look at what Villanova's got to face, and it seems like often when the committee stacks a deck against a team, they fall around early. So Buckeyes are just, they're, they're there. They can do it. They're going to have the home crowd. I know i know Villanova's in Pittsburgh, I mean in Philly, but Philly ain't Pittsburgh. Right. Columbus is just as close to Pittsburgh as Philly. And, yeah, they're going to have their fans, but the Buckeye Nation is not, Villanova ain't got no Buckeye Nation. Right. Villanova don't fill stadiums with 100,000 people that are happy to drive three hours to go watch the basketball team. Play. Right. So... I think you're going to see Tennessee play the Buckeyes. I really do. That's one of my few bigger upsets for the Sweet 16. Uh, I think Tennessee, I, I think going one better on your Rick, yeah. in San Antonio, in their home state, I think Houston beats Arizona. But wow. I don't think Houston can hold on after beating Arizona to beat Tennessee because, it's just, again, we just talked about this too much to ask for to knock out Mike Tyson twice in a row. I would agree with that. And, uh, again, listen, if you were to stipulate Ohio State, I mean, the fact that they're playing in the first round Friday, that's an ex- extra day for everybody to get healthy. If you're stipulating that on Sunday you're, you're going to see Ohio State at their best, and that's what it would take yes. to beat Villanova. But if they're that's at their best, take. they're capable of beating Villanova. Villanova is capable of beating Ohio State when they're not at their best, assuming Ohio State isn't either. 
But if Ohio State's at their best, absolutely that could happen. I don't have that pick in my bracket, but I don't rule that out either that Ohio State could make the, the uh, Sweet 16. Because once again, you know, deserves got nothing to do with it at this point. You're there, the argument is over, and that's that's a trap I've fallen into in the past. I don't mind admitting to it. Of like, ah, this team shouldn't even be there in the first place. This is a joke. And then they go out and win in the first round, and you're like, wait, what? Right, I've fallen in that trap so many times myself. It ruins my bracket, so not this year. And, you know, Villanova does not have a 90. Now, they're right there close with the 89, but they're not a 90. Ohio State's at 85. If you really consider a four-point home field advantage for Ohio State, if you say, follow my logic, it's 89 to 89. Yeah. It's coin flip for those two teams. And you got a chance to pick a seven over a two with a coin flip. That's when you do it if you're trying to win your bracket. Again, we're, we're talking about this from a preview perspective, but we know people that listen to it are trying to win their bracket. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, that, look, that's a real clip and save right there. If Ohio State can do it, it'll be a real, you heard it here first from Nate, kind of a deal. Uh, no question. Uh, the uh, the lower right part of the quadrant, the last one here, uh, the Midwest region, Kansas on the one line at the bottom. It is Auburn on the two. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a region where I do see the possibility for uh, some upsets in here. Uh, I, I've got a mild one. Uh, in uh, the first round here. Actually, uh, as I look at it, no, I, I'm sorry, not not so mild uh, an upset. Two of them that would be fairly substantial. Uh, 13 South Dakota State over four Providence, and uh, one that I think would probably cause a lot of people to swerve off the road if they're driving when they're listening to this podcast. Number 14, Colgate over number three, Wisconsin. You heard it here first. Wow, I heard it there first. So I got Wisconsin the Elite Eight. <laughs> but I'm with you, Rick. Uh, South Dakota State's going to beat Providence. Providence is the 35th best team in the country on the four line. Say what? Yeah, they're the 35th best team in the country on the four line. The committee didn't want them to go anywhere. Right. They got Iowa sitting in the next round if they happen to win that game, but I don't think they will. I think South Dakota State wins that game. I'm with you. But then they face Iowa, who's six points higher than Sagarin, 13th. Good luck. Mm-hmm. They took a team that should have been a four seed, put them on the five line to make sure you're not getting out of the second round, Providence. Yeah. So, but I'm with you. Again, teams that get set up like that for the woo-woo some tend to lose a round early. And South Dakota State's a strong team. They're deep. They're, they're you know, better than lead, and uh, I think they got a shot. I think very so, much so. I think so, too. And this is one of these things we've talked in the past about as far as the showbiz kind of aspect of the uh, the tournament uh, booking. I'm going to use the pro wrestling term, booking, because that's what they're doing, basically. Of uh, When you see something like number 7 USC, number 10 Miami, a couple of historic football powers here. I mean, like, there, that, that didn't just happen, right? No, that didn't just happen. This community never does things that just happen. But I'll tell you what, Miami is the one team that has no business in this tournament outside of Wyoming. Yeah. They had a sag on the 64, but I picked them in there because they finished third in the ACC. You know, not hit the tournament, it's been third in the ACC. That's how it works. So, they're in. Uh, I don't think they're going to beat USC. And I don't I'm not either. a big Auburn fan, mm-hmm. but Auburn's got too much to lose in Greenville to that one either of those two teams. So, Auburn will make it out. But, uh, so... So you have Wisconsin getting beat. Who's your, who's your uh, regional final again? All right. Well, I, I'll tell you what. I, I think we've talked about this. I think Kansas is going to have a relatively soft path. I, I think the, the Sweet 16 game against Iowa, the heater that they've been on, that's going to be an excellent game. But I've got Kansas getting by. The bottom part of the bracket, I mean, if you're talking one or two seeds, outside of Gonzaga, I don't know that there's a one or a two seed with a softer path to get there, possibly – uh, you know, as a result of there may be some upsets along the way, then Auburn. I've got Auburn beating LSU in the Sweet 16 uh, to make it to the uh, Elite Eight game. I think it's going to be a very, very good game, but I have Kansas making it out. I'm going with three number one seeds, which I generally am not want to do, but going on the whole theory of the 90s, uh, again, I think if you're ever going to pick as many as three number one seeds, this could be the year. And we did have a year all four, man. It's been a long time. But yes. It happens. Like 08, I think, uh, yeah. So again, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a we're gonna show the uh, case study. What happens when you make one one single change in a bracket? I like Wisconsin because Wisconsin plays at Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. So even though Colgate might give them a run, Wisconsin's got a whole stadium filled with people. True. So I think Wisconsin wins that game, and and LSU's tough, but I think they win that game too. Mm-hmm. And then they go to Chicago, 
which is a couple hours away. Okay. Auburn is not a couple hours away from Chicago. Right. So I think Wisconsin can beat Auburn in Chicago, but there's no way they're going to beat Kansas because mm-hmm. Kansas is a full six tagger points ahead of them, and Kansas travels. Yeah. So if you think Wisconsin's going to have a home game against Kansas, you're out of your mind. They're not. It's a split crowd, and they're six points worse. So they're not going to beat Kansas. Neither will Auburn. Neither will anybody. Kansas got a gift to lay up straight to the Final Four. That's what this committee wanted. That's what they're going to get. I think so as well. So when we're looking at the final four here, uh, I've got on the one side Gonzaga over Baylor. I'm going with, uh, alas, Tennessee over uh, losing to my Kansas or I, my my Tennessee uh, Vols losing to the Kansas Jayhawks. And then uh, in the national final, I do have, uh, and I think this will be a great game, Gonzaga over Kansas as the uh, Zags take their first national championship. Do you have a tiebreaker total for that game, Rick? That is, uh, yes, uh, 154. I'm going to say Gonzaga 80 and Kansas 74. So one thing to tell people, make sure you do this. If you're really predicting your bracket, look at the matchup of the two teams that will play each other in your finals before you set a tiebreaker. Mm -hmm. Because the pace of the game is going to be completely different depending on who it is. I set my final as 155 with those same two teams. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) What's what's your final, you know? I have Gonzaga over Kansas also in my main bracket, okay. um, and I have a 155 total on that game. Now, let me tell you what I did this year. I mean, I've been in a pool for 25, 30 years almost down home where I'm from, and every year I just enter one bracket. Mm-hmm. This year I looked at it, I'm like, okay, I'm going to drop 50 bucks this year. I'm going to put in five brackets because I'm going to come up with – this is one of these tur- – in you know, most pools you get like 32 points for the champion, 16 for the semis, all that. you got to get the final four right. You gotta get champion or you can never win. So my five brackets are this. I have Gonzaga. Again, my final four is always the same. My brackets are always the same. I've made mistakes in the past and try to go further in the bracket and make other picks. No, not this year. I'm going with the same final four in every bracket. And so those five picks are Gonzaga over Kansas, Gonzaga over Tennessee, Tennessee over Gonzaga, Kansas over Gonzaga. And if Kentucky wins, that means the SEC was the best conference, so I got Kentucky over Tennessee. In the Kentucky-Tennessee games, I set my total at 144, which is a little high, but I think a national championship, they'd run it. And my Gonzaga games are always 155, because Gonzaga doesn't win unless it's 155. But on if Tennessee beating Gonzaga, it's 144. Because Tennessee doesn't win if they run up and down the court. They've got a whole Gonzaga if they're going to beat them. They're going to beat them like they beat Texas A&M 65-50, to 50, but not quite like that because this is Gonzaga, not Texas A&M. Honestly, Nate, so, there's a lot more sophistication to what you did for the total. All I did, I, I, did, I did look at it in terms of the two teams. Okay, I looked at the Gonzaga game log and the, and the Kansas game log, and the games that they played against top competition, both of them, the winners and losers tended to be in the seventies and eighties. So I was just, I was just roughly eyeballing it, but I did do it as a, a, a comp between those two teams. Isolating it to those two teams is always the way to go. Well, that's that's another way to approach it. You understand what the pace is going to be when those teams play those top teams. Mm-hmm. Again, pace changes based on what the matchup is, and usually the stronger team dictates the pace, but not always. Sometimes a stronger team will fall into the trap of the slower team. You know, we, we've seen a lot of basketball to understand this kind of things. But um, it's, a, it's an exciting tournament this year, Rick. Uh, you know, there's, I think, again, I spent a lot of hours looking at how teams compared to the Sagarin work in this tournament. And you got to go, it's one one team every every couple years will make it. It's not a 90. But those are teams that have the, you know, if somebody's going to make it, it's not a 90. It's going to come out of the Kansas bracket because they're not going to play anybody. Right. Kansas don't have to get beat to Iowa. It would probably be Iowa. Right? right. If Kansas doesn't make it, it's probably Iowa. I would, I That's would agree. Be Kansas' hardest game. I would agree because uh, they've been pretty hot recently. And uh, listen, Kansas, I mean, they're, they're a program that has been synonymous, particularly over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, with going out earlier than they should. I remember times when, uh, again, when it was shocking when they went out in the round of 32. So I clearly don't see that happening this time around. But, uh, you know, it, listen, anything is possible. Uh, you know, it, that would mean them losing to San Diego State, which I really don't, uh, you know, uh, see happening. But, uh we shall not see. No, not this year, not the way it's set up. And, uh, again, the, the way the landscape is set up for this year, I'm very confident that our discussion here has prepared everybody for that, to fill out their brackets in this climate with the kind of top-heavy nature 
of a lot of the power teams in the country this year. And uh, like I said, uh, I knew coming in that would be the case. We got everybody ready, Nate. Uh, if they don't uh, win any money, I, it's their fault. I our advice, Rick. I really believe this is here. You're going to be near the top of the leaderboards. Absolutely. These teams are so much better than their competition. And that's how this tournament works. The better teams win, usually, unless you got to face too many better teams in the process. But you and I just broke down how that works. And, uh, you know, a couple different variations there, but certainly a path for people to follow and a logic that I think is uh, – Pretty sound. Absolutely. And I, I'm remembering that one uh, Michael Scott line from the office when somebody says to him, this sounds like a get rich quick scheme. He says, yes, thank you. We are going to get rich quick. So if, <laughs> if, you, if, exactly. you, <laughs> if you listen to us, that's what's going to happen. You'll be winning all the sweepstakes out there. So <laughs> as, as okay. always, Nate, uh, can't thank you enough, buddy. Always appreciate it. Always the best stuff here with our Director of Research, Nate Noy. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to FDH Lounge Mini, Episode 1456.